Ship, Sea and the Stars, the weekly online webcast from Royal Museums Greenwich. We're here every week with amazing stories and expertise, all about space and sea and history and creativity, lots of ideas, um, all with Royal Museums Greenwich curators and special guests. If there's a question that you'd like answered or a topic you really think we should cover, we would love to hear about it. So please look for Royal Museums Greenwich on Facebook, Instagram or Twitter. And today's topic, we are stretching, well, we're going to say we're pushing the boat out and you can, you can take that pun as badly as you would like. Uh, today's topic is a guide to living on other planets. So these past few decades, you know, we've, most of us now have grown up with sci-fi images of other planets somewhere in the background, whether it's Star Trek or Solaris or the Clangers. Um, we're fascinated by the idea of life on other planets and how we might get to it and what it might be like if we got there, whether it's futuristic moon bases or terrifying alien invasions. And um, it's also a fresh start. It's potentially it's a continuation of the human adventure. So, but it isn't just all about science fiction. And this summer, the reason we're doing this episode, episode now is that NASA is planning to send a new rover to the surface of Mars. This one is called Perseverance and it's tasked with looking for signs of past life, uh, something that a lot of people are eagerly awaiting results from. And in the meantime, astronomers are looking at the night sky, looking for planets that might be habitable, perhaps by ourselves or by others. And so although we might only be on the edge of the technologies that will take us to space, humans have been exploring for as long as our species has existed. So maybe there's something to learn from past exploration about the exploration of the future. So we are going to soar into new worlds of possibilities. And to help us with that, we have three fabulous experts. We have an astronomer from the Royal Observatory, curator from the National Maritime Museum, and a science author and broadcaster. So let me introduce them to you. We have Ed Bloomer, who is an astronomer at the Royal Observatory, Jeremy Mitchell, who is the Senior Curator of Maritime Technologies, uh, and Dallas Campbell, who's a science author and broadcaster. So tell us a little bit about your interest in this topic, each of you. Let's start with Ed. Uh, well, I mean, as an astronomer, I get, this sort of the, I get to cheat because astronomy uh, can cover the entire universe. <laughs> so I can, you know, in theory, lock onto anything you want, but uh, in particular, I, I think what one of the things we're going to be discussing uh, is is this Perseverance rover, and and it's in its um, it has a particular launch window, so there's a there's a timely aspect to it. So even though I'm interested in lots of different things, this one's really good because we're going to have to think about what we're doing, well, pretty shortly, basically. Brilliant. So uh, Jeremy, how about you? Uh, what I find um, fascinating is someone whose background is in sort of naval history and polar history is those connections between what we've done in the past and how we've learned from those and use that understanding to push forward into the into the future and also those, those similarities of, of problem solving exercises that they would have done in 1818 when they went up into the arctic for the first time after the uh, napoleonic war and the same problem solving that they're having to do now when they go up into space and last but not least dallas that's what, exactly what I was going to say, Jeremy. <laughs> Literally, word for word, it is. Yeah, it's the, it's the, um, yeah, it's those lovely parallels between the history of exploration, which we now see extended out there into space. In the, the history, the images, uh, for me as well. There's just, I just, there's a great poetry behind it as well. There's this great poetry of, of finding things out uh, that that is that is behind all of that, and I, and I see it. You know, if I if I'm looking at um, you know, the, the old polar missions and the early space missions as well. There is a, a, a sense of, a sort of connection between all of those. And I, I love all that. I love finding those little connections and those little aspects of poetry. And you did, we should mention, you wrote a book called uh, Ad Astra, an illustrated guide to leaving the planet. So you've been digging, which is all full of these little stories. Well, it kind of is, yeah. It's not really a guide to leaving the planet at all. It's really about it's not really about space at all actually it's it's kind of a exactly as we just mentioned about being a human this idea of exploration generally and what it means and the parallels between you know the scientists who winter over in antarctica and and the the, the scientists who are working on the space station for example and and i love finding those little those little uh, space analogs here on earth i think that's a really interesting really interesting thing we see it throughout history the history of exploration generally well so we're going to 
set the perspective here and of course we are going to start with uh, an extract from the writing of Carl Sagan because you have to and it's brilliant. <laughs> it's mandatory it's, it's actually it's compulsory if you to, to not have Sagan at the beginning of and he you know and he was very good at pointing out that we humans think we're dominant and super clever and important but really when you look at the universe we do get put in our place a bit and yet there are still possibilities for our species. So uh, here is Simon Cain reading the, world of, reading the words of Carl Sagan. The size and age of the cosmos are beyond ordinary human understanding. Lost somewhere between immensity and eternity is our tiny planetary home. In a cosmic perspective, most human concerns seem insignificant, even petty. And yet... Our species is young and curious and brave and shows much promise. In the last few millennia, we have made the most astonishing and unexpected discoveries about the cosmos and our place within it, explorations that are exhilarating to consider. They remind us that humans have evolved to wonder, that understanding is a joy, that knowledge is prerequisite to survival. I believe our future depends on how well we know this cosmos in which we float like a mote of dust in the morning sky. These explorations required scepticism and imagination both. Imagination will often carry us to worlds that never were, but without it, we go nowhere. Scepticism enables us to distinguish fancy from fact, to test our speculations. The cosmos is rich beyond measure in elegant facts, in exquisite interrelationships, and the subtle machinery of awe. The surface of the earth is the shore of the cosmic ocean, from it we have learned most of what we know. Recently we have waded a little out to sea, enough to dampen our toes or at most wet our ankles. The water seems inviting. The ocean calls. Some part of our being knows this is from where we came. We long to return. These aspirations are not, I think, irreverent, although they may trouble whatever gods may be. I love that. I love those words. And the, the phrase that stands out for me in there is the subtle machinery of awe. This idea that there's a subtlety to the universe and yet the, re the thing that breaks you apart when you look at it is, is all the nuance and the beauty of the mechanics of it. Um, what, what did each of you pull out of all of that? Uh, Jeremy, do you want to go first? Um, yeah, I, I'm struck by the, the, the sort of balances between our own insignificance, but it doesn't stop us from persevering. And that we have this ability to judge and to dream and to use these to drive ourselves forward as a species. And in some ways, ignore some of the easy stuff and go for the complicated. Uh, and then uh, can be diverted into another area, but someone else will carry on a voyage that you've started. And I find the, the, whole, the whole sort of uh, uh, attention grabbing idea behind this, it, it also creates heroes for people because people are in awe of those who do push those boundaries and they, like polar explorers, become heroes in their own right. Dallas, how about you? Oh God, I get, you know, you could listen to him all day. He is the master of science writing, I think. I, I, no one really sort of betters Sagan in terms of being able to encapsulate the awe and wonder of, 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 of the world. And actually it was funny, you know, listening to that little piece particularly, you can, you can feel those metaphors coming through, the ocean and the shore, making those parallels between sort of human exploration and, and space. And also that always that little nod to the scientific method as well. You know, Sagan was a great advocate for understanding how the human mind works and how you know our, our wanting to believe can often get in the way of what actually nature is doing there's a wonderful uh, quotation of Carl Sagan that he did actually was in the Royal Institution Christmas Lectures 1976 I think um, when we have str when we have strong emotions we are liable to fool ourselves and I always love that and so Sagan always has that kind of one eye on kind of the reality and one eye on the poetry. And, and it's that balance that I, that I love. And, and that, that, that little passage has that in bucket loads. And Ed, how about you? Well, one of the things I really like about uh, this writing is that it's, uh, it has all these things within it. And I particularly enjoy the, I might not be describing this particularly well, but it, it's, it's, it's quite kind in the sense that it doesn't shy away from uh, the, the difficulty of the task or the complexity of various tasks, it, it tries to bring people along uh, 
uh, uh, with the writing and, and with what he's talking about, because um, these are things that can't be achieved by a, a single person. And, and he, he talks a lot about humanities trying to do these things. Um, and I, I think that's that's really good engagement because it doesn't it doesn't isolate you from it. It, it really includes you in everything. And I guess that was why, you know, Apollo and the, when they would look at sending the voyages out, it was it was set up as this is team human doing a thing. Which sure, is, yeah. You which is, yeah, yeah, exactly. The fact, you know, the, the Voyager, probably the most famous thing about Voyager now is the fact that they put that record on, which is this, this record of humanity, the songs and the words and the images and what it is to be, how we are, we sort of look at ourselves, it's this sort of mirror on ourselves. And, only, you know, that, that, all that came from Carl Sagan. And now every spacecraft, in fact, the new 2020 rover has a little plaque on it of Earth and the, 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 the staff and the serpent and things. So this all comes from um from Sagan send the poets out that's what we need to do yeah okay. we need more poets in space <laughs> so Ed we're going to start with you on now we've got to start with you because your first object is the NASA Perseverance rover so introduce this to us okay so obviously this is an object that uh, uh, I don't own um I uh, it is the product as you sort of touched on this this is this is the work of uh, NASA specifically but I, I I think I'm pretty comfortable with that idea of team human um, so we're sending a rover, another rover uh, to Mars, and we have sent rovers in the past. This one's called uh, Perseverance. Um, this one is hopefully launching uh, pretty soon. And I, I think that's one of the things I wanted to just bring up is this idea that when we talk about other types of exploration, uh, there are lots of things that are definitely within our control. Um, and there's lots of things that we, lots of problems we have to solve and lots of, lots of ways we can define a mission. Um, but there are lots of things that are out of our control. And uh, for earlier exploration uh, on Earth, that might be with things like the weather. We can't really do too much about that. Um, but when we, when we talk about uh, space exploration, some of that, it, it's the mechanics of the universe. Uh, we are launching this soon uh, because if we miss a window of opportunity, we're going to have to wait basically about another two years to launch again. Mars doesn't really care whether we're prepared or not. It's going to keep it on its orbit, as is the Earth. And that means we only get certain opportunities uh, to, to launch. So the game here is that both planets are orbiting the sun, but obviously they're going round with a, the, the yeah. time for each of them to go round is different. And you want to pick the bit where they're close enough together. Yeah, I mean, from one to the other. Put, put simply, and, and some of the, you know, when we when send things out, sometimes it's really not simple, but sort of put simply, you kind of have to aim where the planet is going to be so that you meet up. You've got a certain amount of fuel, you can go at a certain speed. Um, and so you have to launch and fire off towards where your target is about to be. Perseverance is going to take months to reach. So we'll launch, but we won't actually land uh, un until next year. Um, and so, yeah, we, we get these uh, few, few opportunities, really. And then sometimes we have to wait. You need patience in this game, don't you? You, 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 you need patience you and you need uh, a lot of careful planning. You can't, you can't just wing these things. Very, very uh, precise indeed. But perseverance itself, the idea is to, to, to land. Uh, and in fact, it's, it, it's fitted with a whole suite of instruments. Um, it's looking for lots of different things. Uh, it's going to explore for, we hope, at least one full uh, Martian year. NASA has a very good track record of actually keeping their machines going a lot longer than they uh, originally spec out for. But uh, it, I think one of the interesting things about this, uh, although people might be thinking, well, we, we have sent rovers in the past, and we've got orbiters and things. You've got to remember, Mars is a whole planet. There's a whole planet's worth of things to discover. And just because uh, there aren't any people wandering around, it doesn't mean that, that you can spend an entire lifetime and, and send, you could send fleets of machinery, let alone, you know, the idea of sending actual you know, people uh, uh, to Mars. As I say, there's a whole planet to discover. This is the very first rover, though, that they've actually that NASA has actually said our primary mission is an astrobiological mission. Our primary mission, number one, is to search for past microbial life on Mars, which I think is pretty exciting. I mean, Viking, you know, that had a sort of astrobiology mission, but it wasn't kind Viking, of Viking was back in the seventies. That was back in the seventies, yeah. yes. So they didn't. There's know the anything. famous picture of Carl Sagan standing next to it on Mars, wearing, <laughs> wearing a, an orange jacket. Photoshop. He wasn't on Mars. He was in the desert. So, so what signs of life, because this is, uh, so I, I think you're right, it's really bold of them. Firstly, because a lot of people would say, oh, there's no life there. What are you looking for that for? You know, that sort of thing. So what, what, uh, what, what are you looking for? If you're looking for past life, I mean, how do you find? It's hard enough to find life in some places on Earth. 
<laughs> how do you well, find life well, on past life on Mars? Well, that gets to the heart of it because uh, you know it's it's quite hard to define what you should be looking for. So a lot what, one of the the, the messages that I think has kind of engaged uh, the public quite a lot is the search for water, um, and whether that is uh, water molecules frozen away that's fine, or or, or um, you know, perhaps some water vapor. Um, water is certainly essential for uh, life on Earth, and so that's a great first step. Um, but I have spoken to uh, other astronomers who are saying, no, 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 we're, we're beyond that. What we want is to look for more complex uh, uh, molecules. Uh, we want to look for uh, different conditions. Uh, um, uh, we want to, and, and, and as I say, a whole suite of instruments. So we, we want to be looking at things like the temperature, not just the temperature itself, but the temperature ranges, things like the wind speed, uh, trace gases within the atmosphere, to build up a much, much more complicated picture of, of, of Mars itself, but to see how that informs uh, the development and, and indeed I suppose actually what we're really interested in also is looking as far back into the past as we can. Um, so I don't think with this because we're looking for so many things and we're going to get so much data which is amazingly exciting but also it means that the message is maybe not quite as simple because really the idea is to build up this if possible very complex uh, uh, picture. And um... Tell us, so you, you're, you've spent a lot of time looking at the early emissions. Just tell us a little bit about the, the evolution in early in Mars exploration. Because it is, I mean, if you look at the sky, Mars stands out, not just because it's bright and it's a planet, but because it's red and it's very, you know, yeah, well, I think made it the well, bringer of war. And it's a very <laughs> evocative thing, isn't it? But tell us just a little bit about how humans, you know, why, why, what, what was it like? Why did people go there? How many messages? What's, what's the point? What's the point? Uh, yeah, well, you're absolutely right. I think. So I want to say sort of Mars exploration began in the 1960s, but it didn't. It began in X years BC, exactly as you say. The Egyptians looked at Mars and wonder, and the Romans looked at Mars and wonder. The Babylonians looked at Mars and wonder. And I think particularly Mars, as you say, it's this kind of red pinprick, but it also has that kind of strange retrograde loop in the sky, if you follow it, this kind of loop the loop, which is, of course, the reason why, because as you say, the Earth and Mars, we're on the sort of inside track as we kind of go around the sun. And so as we sort of overtake, it does a sort of loop the loop in the sky. But of course, that made no sense to the ancients. They thought, wow, this wandering star, this planet, this uh, odd looking thing. So yes, it had sort of supernatural significance. Uh, and then, you know, as our eyes got clearer and clearer and our science got better and uh, gentlemen like Galileo, experimenting with lenses, suddenly Mars became a little bit closer to us. And then people like Herschel got even a bit closer still and Huygens and people like that. And it wasn't just a red dot anymore. Suddenly it was this disc that had structure, that light and dark shades that would move about. And then you had astronomers like Schiaparelli, of course, who famously, the Italian astronomer, who looked at through his telescope and saw these canali, these strange striations across the Martian surface, which he, he called canali, meaning ditch, which of course Percival Lowell, the American astronomer, then took on to mean a kind of a great uh, cosmic geoengineering project. He thought they were actually canals. Which is um, quite deep. <laughs> well, yeah, so, but this is what this was, actually this is Sagan's point, you know, we, we in our fuzzy imagination, we, we see what we, uh, what we already believe. So Percival Lowell thought that Mars was inhabited, in fact, Herschel himself thought that Mars was probably inhabited as well. He, he saw the sort of ch the changing seasons on Mars. But, you know, as our telescopes got better and better, um, Mars became clearer and clearer. And it was really actually the 1960s when proper was particularly we're talking about JPL in America, those great shipbuilders. Um, who, 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 of, of which sort of Voyager is a, is, is a sort of prime example. But actually 1965, that was Mariner 4. Even the name Mariner, Sailor, you know, mar Maritime, that wonderful link. Mariner 4 was the first spacecraft we sent out to do a flyby of Mars and actually take photographs as it flew by. So this is, these are the first images of, of we got of another planet beyond, outside of Earth's atmosphere. So we sent the ship out. And also it was the very first digital camera because they had, they had, an, they had a, a sort of, uh, obviously you couldn't use film, they had magnetic tape. So as it kind of whizzed by, they had one chance to get as many snapshots as they can. I think they got 22, which were then uh, sort of recorded onto magnetic tape on the spacecraft. And then the data from that magnetic tape beamed back to earth. 
Oh, now, God, as that, 22 of the most expensive photographs in history. <laughs> I worked it out. I think it was about 3.8 million per photograph in 1965 <laughs> money. Um, but actually, th all that data that was coming back, they didn't get an image straight away. They just got loads and loads of numbers on a sort of ticker tape machine. And actually, what they did was they sent someone out to the art shop to buy some colored pencils. And they created a kind of a color scale based on the numbers that were coming back. And so they sort of, they, they stuck all these bits of paper up and they it's actually sort of combination them in. of digital and analog. Yeah, and, and it was this wonderful painting by numbers. And you can actually see that original hand-drawn picture. You can see the limb, the edge of Mars there. And actually the first picture that did come back was almost exactly the same. And I think that, that sort of hand-drawn picture, that colored in picture, it's still at JPL somewhere. I think it's outside William Pickering's office or, or somewhere, but it's a wonderful example of, of the sort of data visualization and that, that very, very first image of another planet has that sweep of the human hand, which I think is rather nice. That's brilliant. Well, let's move on because, um, I mean, now we've moved on to actually sending robots there and then engineers have to worry about the practicalities of sending robots there. You, no point sending a rover if you get there and it falls over because you've designed it wrong. And you have, Dallas, a little pot of something that helps oh, yeah. in that process. Show us that. Well, I, I, I got too many objects to bring, <laughs> um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plumb with it. This is some moon dust, a little pot of moon dust. I say moon dust. It's actually simulant moon dust. So this is moon dust uh, that's been, maybe I'll take the lid off. Maybe it's moon, and I'll get it on my computer and I'll break it. Um, moon dust that's been created on earth and it gives a chance for scientists to actually study what this dust is like. So this is chemically and, and mechanically, I suppose, identical to the dust that we find on the moon. Of course, it, you know, this kind of dust behaves very, very differently on earth because of our, we have an atmosphere and because our gravity is different. But this dust, obviously, you know, as we go back to the moon, the Artemis project um, program, our return to the moon in the next few years, you know, the dust is a real problem for things like spacesuits, my other, my other um, objects I want to bring, because it gets everywhere. And because this dust hasn't weathered as dust weathers on Earth, it's very, very abrasive. It's very, very jagged. And it's sort of the electrical charge actually sticks to things. But also we can do really amazing stuff with this. We can build with it. We can 3D print with it. We can use it as a kind of cement to at some so point. That what's in this pot has come, you know, it was after Apollo that, you know, they looked at what came back on with astronauts from Apollo yeah. on that. Yeah, well, I mean, you can look at the, the Apollo suits now that are all in, in the Smithsonian. I mean, I've looked, at, I've looked very closely at the Apollo suits and all that moon dust has really destroyed those suits. And those suits, you know, which cost millions and millions of dollars, were only used for a matter of hours. And just in a matter of hours on the lunar surface, they were pretty much wrecked. Um, it's incredibly abrasive, the, the, the beta cloth that those suits are made out of. And you can actually look at the suits through the microscope and see how this dust has you know, embedded in it and, dis and broken fibers. And, and, it, and it's really, really, you know, there's pictures online if you Google and you can see how dirty the, the Apollo astronauts became. So actually things like suit design, if we're going to go to Mars as, as humans to explore, we need to know how you know, Martian dust behaves, how lunar dust behaves, but it's also a valuable resource as well. I mean, you know, you can build with this, you can build habitats, uh, which is going to be very useful if we're going to spend any time on the, on the, the lunar surface. It's not a very um, conducive place to be as a human being. And as far as we know, is just on that thing of, because obviously one of the things about going into space is you don't want to have to bring everything from Earth. Is, is all lunar dust the same everywhere on the moon, as far as we know? Or is no, I think, I think it's, I think there's, I think, you know, it's, it's very different. I mean, the, the, the geology of the moon is, is varied and interesting, but there is a lot of this, <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is, <laughs> you ain't going to run out of this on the moon. Um, uh, so actually, as you say, if we're going to go there for any period of time, we're going to have to learn to live off the land. And one thing that we have in this is, um, is a, is a building material. Uh, and it's also sharp and abrasive. It's sharp and abrasive. It's a damaging one. Yeah. Well, it's really interesting. It's, it, it's, it's quite counterintuitive. It's like, why, well, why is this dust different to dust on earth? Well, dust on earth weathers and it moves around and it gets carried in the atmosphere but on the moon it doesn't get carried on the atmosphere it just it goes up and it comes straight down again and, and there's no weathering on the moon in the same way but there is, it's there one is of those unexpected things isn't it when people think about other planets they think about you know maybe green rivers or funny yeah. shapes 
but there's these really tiny little details which actually would become life and death issues well totally and the thing is it's like you know when the apollo astronauts explored the moon we didn't really have any of that knowledge you know we had the knowledge that we had in 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 the 1960s when we were building things like spacecraft and spacesuits you know they were still like well maybe the spacecraft will sink into the certain no one really knew uh, now we have that knowledge and we can use things like spacesuits, which are kind of fossils of the 1960s and study them and make our exploration better. And, and, and you know, that's how science works. You well, know we'll this because you're a scientist. Yeah. <laughs> well, not a space one. We'll come back to your uh, suit later. But we're just we're going to move on to the, you know, humans love to explore these places. And as we covered at the start, there is this poetry and the stories being the same. And we have another short quote now. This is from Neil Armstrong uh, from an interview with Jim Hansen. And this is his perspective on humans in exploration and it's read by Simon Cain. We have learned how to navigate to the moon. That is like the ancient Chinese mainlanders learning how to get to Formosa. Formosa is the moon. After we settle it, we jump off from there to Mars, just like they went next to the Philippines, and from there across our vast galaxy. If the Austronesians can sail in their boats and scatter into settlements across Oceania, we can take our spacecraft and scatter and settle across the Milky Way. It may take even longer than it took the Austronesians, but if they did it, so can we, because they are us. So right in there, there is this the idea that the technology changes, but the humans don't. Now, Jeremy, you have a picture from an early expedition, um, which really speaks to this. Show, tell us about this. Uh, yeah, so um, in our photographic collection, uh, we have a series of photographs taken in 1854. Uh, I have a mock-up of um, the, the negative in question, uh, which is this here. So this is um, uh, a mock-up of an eight by six inch glass plate negative taken by a naval captain on his way to support the Franklin search expedition. And uh, its subject matter is uh, a Greenland Inuit uh, hunter uh, posing with his kayak, his oar, uh, with the harpoon and the inflated bladder that um, uh, was used to prevent um, things from sinking after they'd harpooned it. And what it really speaks to us is about the adaptability of humans in harsh environments and the ability to then use what is in that environment to live there, not just to survive there. And it really contrasts the European experience of, of polar exploration where we tended to fill our ships up with things that were familiar to us and then launch ourselves off to the polar regions and then live out of that ship. Uh, and here you had a, a culture that had adapted over centuries to actually live within the, the fluctuating seasons and, and uh, uh, environment. And it, it does speak to the, the idea of spaceships as well. You're having to transport everything that's familiar to you out into a hostile environment that is not natural to, uh, to where the humans normally would, uh, would reside. Um, but I, I just love it also because it raises questions about what do you do when you meet other uh, um, creatures, animals, whatever we would uh, class them as in our desire to put things into pigeonholes. Um, as an explorer or a colonizer, you know, how, how have you treated each other as humans in different cultures to how you then treat someone on another planet because you are actually the interloper on someone else's planet rather than the other way around. Well, the thing, one, the thing that first struck me about this photo when I saw it is how astonishingly modern it looks. The canoe looks like a canoe that you might use today. You know, people don't harpoon seals quite as often, but some, although that does still happen. And you wouldn't look at this picture and identify a year that it had come from. And, and the thing that, that I think about that is that the human mind is the same, you know, the, the problem solving, given the same tools, we would probably come up with the same solution today, 170 years later. Um, and also I thought what was interesting is, is it sort of implies a split, you know, we know the human population split, that some of them got there first and adapted and, and then others came on later and maybe that would happen in space, you know, sci-fi books are full of one lot went first and, and created a, a spin-off civilization and then the other earthlings you know, wanted in. It, it's it's really complicated. It's more complicated socially, perhaps, than technically, isn't it? 
I, I think so. And um, in fact, uh, um, I read somewhere that um, when uh, the Inuit were moved into the Arctic regions, there was already uh, a, a, a sort of, a, a sort of a homo sapien species living there. It's quite interesting that, though, you know, that, that idea of, of islands, tiny islands and big, big oceans coming across each other. And of course, that's reflected as well in, in the history of spaceflight. Again, all roads lead to Carl Sagan. At the Voyager spacecraft, here we had an opportunity where we were actually going to, an object created by human beings was going to leave the solar system and actually enter the interstellar medium and head out into deep space to who knows where. And of course it throws that question, you know, if it gets intercepted by someone, how, how do we as a species want to represent ourselves? What, what is it we want to say about us? And of course this became that wonderful project, the golden record that was attached to the, to the spacecraft. I they had like two weeks to do it, to, to get all the music together and, and, and it was, it's become this fantastic project. And actually music and, and, and sound and, is, uh, as this sort of universal language, like how do you talk to people? Seems like a still seems like a reasonable, a reasonable way of doing it. I think, I and think the fact that it was a vinyl record, you know, vinyl. With a stylus. That's the really interesting question. Technology. Is that if you did that today, would you do the same? <coughs> I think a lot of the things they would be similar because they're human. But then there's some things that are very of their time, like vinyl record. You know, those vinyl records existed for what thirty years as a. Like, yeah. But, well, know. I'm still. I still have vinyl. I'm still all on vinyl <laughs> because I'm old. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's kind of interesting with that, with regards to that, you're talking about the sort of the timeliness of things, and it's a very challenging uh, problem to try and represent something in a way that's understandable, even if you don't have to worry about the how different an alien psychology might be. And I, and I think you can sort of do a little test. If you um, got a teenager uh, now, okay, so they've been educated, uh, uh, um, um, but they, they're not necessarily familiar with things like vinyl or the positions of uh, various pulsars or something, and you showed them a replica of, of, of the golden record, what would they do with that? How would they, uh, how, how would they understand it? Is, so it yeah, there's, there's a great meme of like, of teenagers trying to work out a rotary phone. <laughs> exactly yeah, sure. that. Like, yeah, okay, exactly. call me. Exactly. Like, how the hell does this work? Well, that's you know, interesting and, because the aliens are then us. The aliens are us 50 yeah. later. I mean, oh, they're absolutely, cool. yeah. On the cover of the golden record, I should point out, and actually it's not made of vinyl, it is, it's, it's made of, gosh, is it aluminium or brass or gold? I can't remember, oh, but on the cover there are, there are alien instructions. There's instructions for the aliens and a stylus for, for how it works. Sure, but, but, it, but even when they try and explain for what's a zero and what's a one, yeah. if somebody shows you and goes, this is what they mean, they mean that that's raised and that that's lowered, and this is how you interpret it. Yeah. If someone explains that to you, you would go, oh, right, okay, I see, I see. But if there's nobody to explain that to you and you just get presented with a hunk of metal with some squiggles on it, <laughs> it's a very challenging thing. I mean, they, they, they're considering these problems with things like how to dispose of nuclear waste. You know, it's a, it's a bit off topic here, but, you know, it, that's something you, you, you're you going to have to store for a long, long period of time. You think, well, how do, how do you write instructions to somebody that might have to deal with in 5,000 years' time? Say, well, okay, you, you put a big skull on it to let everybody <laughs> know it's deadly. It's, well, Okay, but a skull's a, a skull's a, a, a sort of a human thing. Um, and even if you're not talking about non-humans discovering it, you might get a bunch of uh, humans a thousand years uh, from now thinking, well, it's definitely okay for people because it's got a picture of a, a yeah, human skull. So it's, it's one of yeah. us. So it's fine. We'll, we'll open this up. Well, no, no, no. That's So that sort of thing, it, it, you know, even 50 years is a, is a bit of a gulf. It's this th the years. human imagination. And we exactly right, Eddie. You can't really imagine deep time and that's what the voyager spacecraft is, is about it's trying to imagine what deep time actually is because that that spacecraft in the interstellar medium it's not going to rust it's not going to bump into anything it will outlive the pyramids it'll probably outlive us you know and that's a how and like you say burying things underground nuclear waste exactly problem what what will language become in uh, in 10,000 years, I mean. And exactly. we take decay for granted because we're used to life. We live on a planet which has yes. lots of life and things decay. And the idea yeah. of things not decaying is somehow ethereal and different. Okay, we're gonna move on because there are many things that we have to discuss we haven't got to yet. <laughs> um, I've so got my Carl Sagan book collection. That's oh, the yeah. one to read about the golden record, Murmurs of Earth. It's uh, the most fantastic book. Okay, you've got your, I would point out to anyone that Dallas has always has a different favourite Carl Sagan book, depending on what day of the week it is. That's the best one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if you are just joining us and wondering about the uh, Carl Sagan fan club here, yes. 
This is Ship, Sea and the Stars, the weekly online broadcast from Royal Museums Greenwich. And this week we are discussing uh, a guide to life on other planets, or maybe getting there, or maybe what we should do when we do get there. And it's all to coincide with the launch of a new Mars rover, Perseverance. And uh, we're joined by astronomer Bloomer, curator Jeremy Mitchell, and space geek Dallas Campbell, I'm sure he won't mind that description. Now, we are going to move on to some of the practicalities of uh, exploring in hostile environments. And Jeremy, your second object is a very practical thing. Tell us what this is. Yeah, so this is a suit uh, donated to us by um, the British Antarctic Survey and is now on display in the Polar Worlds Gallery uh, in the museum. And it uh, stands next to the 1915 equivalent worn on the Douglas Mawson expedition. And uh, what I love about it is that uh, there are similarities between the two, but what you have here is uh, new technologies coming in and new experiences. So this is uh, down padded, which is more efficient than the gabardine and canvas that they were wearing in 1915. Just you saying uh, that makes me shiver. The idea of going to the South Pole in something made of canvas. Uh, yes, and, and you had your long woolen socks and your many layers uh, of long johns and so on. So in the, even in 1915, they had an idea about layering up. Um, because when you're man hauling, you do a lot of sweating. It's about wicking that sweat away. So um, even now, um, the British Antarctic Survey teams, they, they do different layers with the different kinds of work that they're doing um, because you sweat more or less. And uh, uh, of course, the, the, the 1915 uh, clothing being a lot more simple, if you broke something, you could stitch on a new piece of string and tie it back up again. But when you break a plastic zip, there are a few other issues. So I, I know, having spoken to some um, uh, Antarctic explorers, that they that they they actually quite like a bit of old technology because it's easier to repair than modern technology. But the the suit um, also shows how we've begun to understand more about our own bodies in order to know how to then design and develop the the clothing that we need in order to live in these harsh environments that are slightly alien to the more temperate places that we live. Uh, is this still changing? Is the sort of is, is there are there more advances? As someone who's worn suits like this, they seem pretty good to me. Could they be even better? Uh, that's a good question. I, I I'm not sure. I suspect that um, there will be uh, a, a lot more use of different kinds of metals where you're reflecting heat backwards and forwards uh, uh, in in suits, uh, and you'll probably find. Uh, that technology being used to design spaces will feed back into what you might wear in the Antarctic uh, and vice versa because the, the Antarctic has been used as a, uh, as a, a sort of experimenting field for, uh, for future or for space exploration in terms of your clothing and also the technology and equipment that you might take and how you live away from home and the psychology of being away um, I, I read somewhere yesterday that, the, that one of the recommendations from polar explorers to um, space explorers was you have to have somewhere where you can go and be alone um, because you're living in such a confined space. Actually, that, that moment to be by yourself is, is very important. Even, you find that by even, yourself might, even though being by yourself might mean away from the only two other people who are within 100,000 miles of you, <laughs> um, it still matters. Uh, I, I think so. I think it, it does. And, uh, and it informs things like your, your leadership. Uh, how, how are you going to design your leadership? Are you going to have a leader or are you going to do things by command where it's a slightly different structure, different emphasis? So um, the, the work done in the polar regions uh, is a way of informing how we as humans might continue to act and react and interact with each other while we're thousands and hundreds of thousands of miles away from your home planet. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, if you look at the early astronauts, the Apollo astronauts, they were test pilots. They could fly the most ridiculous machines in the world and still come home. Mm -hmm. And whether they could, you know, get on with other people was sort of a secondary issue. Whereas now getting on with people is seen as a, you know, they had a, I don't know, three or eight day mission. It was very short. Yeah, I mean, the, ast the, astro the astronaut job description has changed completely since the first, you know, since Project Mercury in the, the sort of late 1950s, 
when the Americans were saying, well, okay, well, what kind of people would, should we be sending into space? And they were, well, what about kind of submariners or what about even sort of circus acrobats were sort of discussed? I mean, what? Who, oh, who, I love who, that. Who, Where were the astronauts in the circus? Who are we going to send? But, um, but yeah, I mean, but the thing about the Apollo astronauts is that, as you say, test pilots made sense. Actually, the reason test pilots were chosen was mainly a speed thing. It was mainly be actually because these guys had top, top security clearance already. They didn't have to go through the rigmaroles of security clearance. And the speed was, a, was of the essence. That was one of the things. And the obvious thing was, of course, that they have to operate mach machinery at risk. But a trip to the moon is only, it's only a couple of days. You know, it's like three days there, three days back. It's like a, it's like a camping trip. If you're on a, a couple of week camping trip, you can get by on basic rations. But if you're doing six months on the International Space Station, or if you're doing a year to Mars, a year on Mars, and a year, you know, that's, that's a whole different thing, which is why somewhere like Concordia in Antarctica, which is where they do this uh, space analog training, is so important because it, that is one of the, it's one of the, it, in fact, it's the only, analog space training simulator i suppose where there is no door to reality because once you're wintering over in antarctica in somewhere like concordia you ain't coming back no one can fly in to get you out if you're if you're doing another one of these sort of mars you know analog simulations there's always a door you can walk through if something really goes badly wrong and also as you say you know antarctica it's it's similar to somewhere like Mars. The temperatures are not dissimilar. If you're going outside in complete blackness, you have to wear, you know, this extraordinary clothing. You can't just do it. It's so it's, and of course, the, the psychology as well. So it's a useful an analog. The, the hivernauts, they're called, the people who... Uh, the hivernauts. Hiver, hiver, French okay. for winter. The winter nauts who winter over in Antarctica is doing this. Their oh, well, that's a great phrase. So if you don't think you're ever going to be an astronaut, maybe you can be a... An Eva Nort. An Eva Nort, yeah. Well, they call it White Mars. You know, there's, you know, they, they <laughs> you know, these um, people who who sort of winter over there. But it's the, the, the parallels are similar. similar. Yeah, and the, and especially the importance of small little human things. You know, on those expeditions and the, the ones I've been on, the the little human things. People pay a lot of attention to that because it does make an enormous difference. Okay, from from the from the uh, the, the uh, Eva Nort suit. For Antarctica, we are going to move on to Dallas's spacesuit, which is behind you there now. It's not quite a real spacesuit, but it's pretty close. It's well, in the way that this is a simulant, <laughs> this is also simulant. Although, Helen, you, you've worn this. You're the I last person, I think, it, to, yeah. to wear that. You, you very kindly modelled it for me. This is a, a replica of Neil Armstrong's uh, uh, A7L lunar excursion suit, of course. Probably the most, I would, I would argue, the most famous suit of clothes ever made. You know, Henry VIII suit of armor, Elvis's white jumpsuit, you know, Aloha 1971, I think it was, and Neil Armstrong suit, the three of them, you know, the kind of uh, the most extraordinary outfits ever made. But uh, yeah, it's, um, you know, clothes extend us as humans and, and the, as technology has got better, things like spacesuits, which are basically a wearable spacecraft. It is a suit that holds pressure. So unlike your, your um, Antarctica gear, it doesn't wick. <laughs> <laughs> Sweat doesn't wick. You have to come up with an engineering solution to, to deal with things like that. In, in this case, they had liquid cooled garments. So water was actually pumped through tubes that was sort of sewn into a, a, a kind of, uh, a sort of cotton underwear and that would actually carry the, 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 the heat away. Um, but no, they're inc incredibly sophisticated um, pieces of uh, pieces of clothing. Twenty-one different layers of different kind of materials, all of which have to do a job. But essentially, it is a wearable balloon. It inflates, and that gives you the pressure that you need in somewhere like a vacuum. But actually, uh, you know, a bit like the bit of string around the the the, the, the canvas jackets that they have, the Russian spacesuits that they still wear on on, on the Sokol spacecraft. The way that that rubber balloon the, the bladder inside is sealed it's still just a rubber band you, you know you, you you fold up the edge you crinkle it together and you wrap a rubber band and that that holds it together so even something like sophisticated like a spacesuit it's pretty actually the, the kind of fundamentals are pretty basic well if it works it don't break it and the other thing yeah. that i like about these spacesuits is the story of who made them and especially because 
it wasn't necessarily it wasn't all men and it wasn't all you know they were no the creation of these things was a very human endeavor they didn't just you know emerge from some factory full of robots well they didn't know what what are we going to wear in space well we had no idea well we're going to need different materials so we need a company that, that you know works with different materials and you know something like a bra for example you've got kind of elastic and you've got structural things going on and padding you know all this kind of stuff so playtex was the obvious choice so they went to playtex a division of playtex called ilc dover and in fact all the women who were working there you know in the garment district in delaware at the time making stitching bras and luggage and boxing gloves and whatever it was because they were brilliant seamstresses they were all just brought on the production line to to make these spacesuits and of course they are examples of mixed materials so you've got you know <clears throat> aluminium next to uh, elastic next to neoprene nylon all this new materials that were coming on in the, after the second world war you know companies like dupont and all these different things were, all went into the manufacture of those so you have this wonderful history combined with technology combined with the new world of material science combined with adventure uh, and you get this you know it, it, the most iconic item of clothing ever made. The thing I like that about it is it's very leveling because there's this perception that, you know, technology, uh, there's, there's, the, there's the, the people with the most degrees and the most technical expertise, and then there's the, as that's on the gloves, right? It's, and, but there's the, and then there's the people who sort of sew things, but actually the astronauts would have understood that for all the, the brilliant male technologists, it was the yep. women sewing the thing that was going to keep them alive. <laughs> well, absolutely. I mean, this is this is about craft and 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 the women who, you know, it's every every single stitch, ha you know, had to be measured. It had to be a certain size. And yes, they use sewing machines as well, but just the level of craft and detail that went into the manufacture of these of these objects is just incredible. Actually, I just wanted to show you because this is so. This is a glove. You can see. Um, maybe you can see how kind of the kind of rubber how it's made, but it is just a balloon. If you sort of blow into it, you know this glove will, would 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 hold pressure. Um, anyway, it's a it's a beautiful object. I mean, you know, this was made by Ryan Nagata, I should say, who makes who makes props, uh, spacesuits for for movies and, and and what have you. But it's an absolutely bang on perfect uh, replica. You know, there right. you go. Yeah, with his name, a million name. As well. Um, so, so we've got all this craft and all this technology that we could use uh, to go out to space. And the question is that if you can go out there, where might you go? Say we say we get to Mars and then we're bored of Mars. Where could, where else could we go? Well, Ed has an object for us, which is somewhere where we could go. Um, Ed, tell us about the Trappist One system. So I, I thought in some ways I might play the villain a little bit because I, I was going to pour a bit of cold water on some of these ideas. There's lots of threads uh, to pick up here, but the problem with the universe uh, being the size it is and complex it is and full of as much stuff as it is and also emptiness, um, is that we have to think about all these things, but, but more so. So the temperature ranges, more so the, uh, the changes in pressure, uh, atmospheric composition and all those things. When you're exploring on Earth, although there are definitely parallels um, to what we might be doing you know, in, in future, um, you know, the sea is not also made of acid while you can't breathe any of the air and also it's, a mi it's minus 200 uh, degrees or something like that. And you get that sort of uh, condition out there in space and in various uh, worlds. So even if we're bored of Mars and we decide we're going to head off uh, to, on a galactic scale, sort of next door, Trappist-1, uh, 40, uh, about 40 light years away, um, which puts it you know, with current rocket technology, if you had the fuel and you had the drive, that's uh, well, it's about 800,000 years of, of, of flight away. Um, so back of the envelope calculation. Quick, you know, holiday. No, exactly. Exactly. So, so all these things about the psychology of people getting involved in it. Well, it's not your grandchildren and it's not your great grandchildren. And you'd, I don't know how many greats you'd have to add to that. They're the ones that might arrive. You'd be um, very inbred by the time you got there, I think. Well, well, well exactly. You, you're not going to send a crew of, <laughs> of three. That's, that's not going to work out. So you have all these massive extremes. And, and Trappist-1, I think, was worth bringing up a little bit because um, it, a couple of years ago, when we started talking about this, and it, it sort of uh, came into the news about, well, this is a multi-planet system. Um, it's got a few planets that are in a very broad sense, kind of close to some of the characteristics of Earth. Again, we're, we're, we're talking pretty broad, but it's, it's the specifics that are, are, are potentially going to be a, a 
what was going to be issues, uh, uh, let's say. So uh, I, we, we are hunting for exoplanets. We've discovered more than uh, 4,000 and, and exoplanets, these planets that orbit other stars. So we, we've discovered uh, more than 4,000. Sounds like a lot, but in fact, it's, it's just a pretty small population sample. And already we find planets that are thousands of degrees. They're far too close to their hot star so life will be unlivable there. We, we have planets where you know the temperature isn't that much above absolute zero, they're completely unlivable. So all the things about Earth, even if you think it gets too hot or too cold or too windy or too wet, or there's not enough food sometimes, um, or, or, or you know even the air is a bit too thin to breathe, you're still talking very, very, very tight parameters. And once we launch into a much, much more complex and much larger playground, um, even something like TRAPPIST-1, which with broad strokes seems like it's, 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 it's a little bit like another solar system analog, multi-planet systems, some of them are a little bit like Earth in, in some small ways that you want to talk about. Um, actually, you, the, the problems haven't gone away. Um, they, they've become, uh, at the moment, I would say immeasurably uh, more difficult for us. And then, so when it comes to the concept of habitability, um, you know, you know the, there's first of all the question whether it's just habitable for us or habitable mm -hmm. for someone or something. What, sure. What, what does it mean to be, I mean, what can we tell if somewhere is, I mean, obviously if it's 3000 degrees, it sounds unlikely, but is it impossible? Well, I think the problem is you talk to a dozen different astronomers, you might get a dozen different answers. On, on a really simple uh, level, people might say, well, let's just talk about temperature. Uh, let's say that it doesn't have to vary plus or minus too much from whatever the Earth is, right? Um, but as you'll know yourself, of course, things like, uh, well, does it have an ocean or not? Or oceans, uh, how do they move heat around? What's the uh, cloud cover like? How much uh, uh, light and uh, heat is being reflected uh, back? How much uh, radiation is there going to be? Um, so. Sometimes, uh, what I think, I, or what I sometimes worry about, because I think I, there's maybe the fatigue of hearing about these things too much, is we do get quite a few announcements uh, coming, you know, quite a few times a year where they say, oh, right, okay, it's Earth, Earth 2, we've discovered Earth 2. And sometimes what that boils down to really is somebody saying, well, look, if, you, if you're very generous about the parameters, <laughs> then maybe there's somewhere that maybe liquid water could exist for some of the time. And you think, well, that's, that's, that's great, but that's, uh, that doesn't mean I can wander around outside, breathe the air, uh, there's, there's sort of ambient insect life and, and things like that. And all the stuff that makes a sort of a comfortable existence uh, here on Earth uh, uh, possible. So I think we've come back around, we are running out of time uh, a bit, but we've come back around from, you know, exploring the immensity of existence and that phrase, that, you know, those words from Sagan at the start about the, all the things that are out there. And what you've basically just said is that, well, where we are is pretty good. If you want something special, we're probably standing on it. Um, yeah, we, I, mean, I mean, the Earth is, uh, is not bad. almost perfect. <laughs> in, not in, bad. You know, if, if you look at the big picture, it's, 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 it's really pretty oh, good right. indeed. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, there's some things that make us uncomfortable, but we, you know. But on the it, grand scale of the universe. It, on Definitely. the grand scale of the universe, it, it, it's pretty much spot on. And, that, and that's the difficulty. But I would say just, just a last thing, maybe to, to, to sort of bring in things like, um, you know, if we're, we're talking about, um, uh, you, you know, coping with environments, say like, like Greenland or something like that. Um, even that, we're, we're still getting, uh, we're still on Earth, uh, at least. But I do like the idea, and that was sort of demonstrated in the picture, that as soon as we've got new technology, as soon as we've found something, we, we, we put it to use. So we are chipping away at these problems. Um, I think that's something to be positive about. So there's hope for the explorers yet. Okay, very, very, very quickly, I want a super short answer from each of you. Uh, I have a question, and it is this rover, which is about to go to Mars, um, going to look around. What would you most like it to find? Um, uh, who's going to go first? Maybe Jeremy. Um, I think that uh, it would be interesting to find whether there is uh, an absolute source of water on Mars to help us begin that building block of life, because when you've read your when you've read your you know, uh, um, um, War of the Worlds by H. T. Wells, there's always going to be a question for every human as to whether there's life up there. So, 
So starting that process properly would be really good. So water for you. Uh, Ed, how about you? Well, I'm going to go to possibly a silly extreme. I'd like a little Martian to walk up, wave at one of the cameras and um, <laughs> sort of invite, invite, invite the rover back to, to its house. I oh, think that'd be great. That would take a lot of the pressure off. We'd at least sort of think, <laughs> okay, we're on to a good thing here. So I think that's what I'll go for. Now that's how about you? Well, uh, let's, life is a given. You know, the primary objective of, of, of the rover is to, is to find evidence of life. So I'm not going to say life. You know, the, the, the thing that I'm most excited about this rover secretly is this will be the very first time we've ever put microphones on Mars. All those things, we've never been able to hear it. Now, Mars has a very, very thin atmosphere, of course, so it might be very... But I just want to hear what the Martian dust storm sounds like. I'm in for that. That sounds brilliant. Fabulous. Right. We have definitely run out of time now. So uh, we will be back uh, in future weeks, lots more weeks with more museum objects and stories of sea and the space and history and creat creativity. Do get in touch, uh, Royal Museums Greenwich on Facebook, Instagram or Twitter. The next, last week we heard that the Cutty Sark was reopening this coming, uh, or last weekend, and this week the Royal Observatory will be reopening to visitors. It has been a long time. All the astronomers are, will be there, very willing to welcome guests back. Uh, the Cutty Sark is still open and you can find everything you need to plan a safe visit there at rmg.co.uk slash welcome back. And it only remains for me to thank our fabulous contributors, Ed Bloomer, Jeremy Mitchell and Dallas Campbell. Uh, thank you to Simon Kane for the readings, to Steve Thompson for the music. James Gill was the producer and I'm Helen Chersky and we will see you with more fabulous ideas about everything next week. Thank you.